You're listening to Payments Innovation, a podcast dedicated to helping business leaders navigate today's global digital economy. Looking to learn about the latest innovations within fintech and payments? You've come to the right place. Let's get into the show. So welcome to another edition of Currency Cloud's Payments Innovation Podcast. Um, Very exciting one today. Uh, I've actually, I think, been promoted to a super host because I have two guests. Um, And we have some financial services royalty today. Um, (laughs) So Dave Birch joins us. And Dave, so... I, I went through your bio and it took me about 10 minutes to read. So you're you're widely recognized as a thought leader in the space. You're ranked, uh, what, top 15 favorite sources of business information, according to Wired Magazine. I was, yes. Was really yeah, cool. official fintech ambassador of Jersey, we've just yeah. learned. You've been plugging Jersey. Um, Next Bank called you a fintech titan. <laughs> you're a, a previous... Yeah, you're a previous EPA contributor um, of the year, top 100 most inf- influential fintech leaders. The list goes on, but by far my favorite one is um, you are or were a member of the very secretive payments Illuminati, which I thought was fantastic. So presumably a, a special handshake. So welcome, Dave. Um, and we've also got Piers Murray. Um, that's all I had for you, Piers. <laughs> Thanks, Rich. No, well, actually, no, on, on the list no. of the, the top fintech influencers, I was number 53,000 and something last year and, and dropped off the list this year, unfortunately. So, uh, Listen, I, I guess Piers is, Piers is our resident um, expert on all things payments at Currents Cloud. Um, he's a product director in this field. He is a self-confessed payments geek um, and also very relevant to this field. He has a first-class uh, degree from the University of Edinburgh in Spanish and Latin. So I'm sure very relevant. Yeah. Uh, anyway, listen, great to have you both. Um, and today we're going to be talking about the world of, of, of payments and in particular kind of Swift and Swift GPI. Um, so I wanted to kind of get into it. And, and Piers, we, we at Currency Cloud recently um, released a white paper on Swift GPI. Um, and I think we addressed the question of um, whether it will re- revolutionize the future of global payments. But let's start with what it is. So sure. What is Swift GPI? Sure. So, so GPI, just to start with, actually, as, as an acronym definition, stands for the, the Global Payments Initiative, um, uh, and it's effectively the the Amazon parcel tracking equivalent in the international payment space. That's probably the, the simplest way to kind of start off um, with that analogy. And uh, look, at its core, it's actually a really simple thing. Every Swift wire payment gets um, gets allocated a unique ID, something called the UETR, the Unique End to End Transaction Reference. Um, and Swift has, has created effectively a, a data lake. So when every uh, payment travels through the, the correspondent banking network, um, that unique reference number, the UETR, is used to uh, effectively record different events across that payment that allow GPI members to then see those events from the data lake. And, and effectively, there are four, um, I guess, pillars, benefits to, to the end users, consumers of, of, of this. First is around speed. So GPI members have to adhere to certain SLAs in terms of of processing speed. The second is around the visibility of the payment. So there's been loads of frustrations previously with with the senders of of payments not really understanding exactly um, where they are at any one point in time. So that data lake allows GPI members to see exactly where a payment is at any point in the network at any point in time. Um, The third is about the the transparency of, of charges. So again, based on previous frustrations, who has deducted what amount from the principal at what point in time? And the fourth is then about the certainty of payment. So again, being able to see that a payment has not just been forwarded by a correspondent or not just landed with a beneficiary bank, but has actually credited the beneficiary bank account. And, and that starts to become really powerful in terms of you know, future use cases, I think, going forward to see that money has actually credited you, your account. You know definitively, um, either as the sender um, or the receiver that money has has credited the account and 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 really those the combination of those four things I think is is um, is, is contributing to what we're calling that that revolution or perhaps just evolution but um, either way revolution or evolution of, of cross border payments. So Dave, so Piers talks about this as kind of an Amazon style kind of tracking and and I remember when kind of we were setting up Currency Cloud kind of over ten years ago we had this kind of vision of this UPS style we called it the UPS style. Um, tracking, but so Swift GPI was what first launched back in 2017, adopted by some of the banks late 2017. Um, 
we, I think we were the first non-bank to implement this um, last year. But Dave, why has it taken so long? If, if all of these benefits are clear to the user, why has it taken someone like Swift so long to launch something like this? Well, I mean, it has taken a while, obviously, because anything involving coordinating international banks takes a while. But actually, I mean, we, I mean, we shouldn't knock it. I mean, it's been pretty, pretty successful, frankly. I mean, if you look at the, Piers knows the figures better than I do, but a pretty substantial proportion of SWIFT payments already go through GPI. And I, I can't remember what the average time is now, Piers, but it's it's minutes when it used to be days. So, so actually... Yes, it took a while to, to 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 coordinate and get everything moving, but the truth is, it's it's working pretty well. It's it's actually been pretty successful, and it has a it has quite an impact because obviously one of the one of the frustrations that a lot of people have in the in the fintech world because they think payments the fintech people think payments are easy because they think it's just to do with moving a few bits around they don't realize what really goes into it but but one of their things well how can it be so complicated and so expensive and so time consuming and of course they hold swift up as their bogeyman oh it takes days and whatever but but the, that's actually not really true anymore mm -hmm. so i think the 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 sort of discussion really should be around you know is is swift gpi the last gasp of the old order, if you see what I mean, or, or or is it the first step in the in the new direction? And and depending on your and depending on your views and your your the the nature of your personality, you can sort of see it in either way. And I think, well, look, what one way people can think about this, I know Pierce thinks this is a bit odd, but but what, one way of thinking about GPI is. Is basically like, is it is it the Cutty Sark? So I think probably a lot of people listening to this podcast. <laughs> this is great, by the way. I saw it's cut across. No, but you know what I mean. You, I mean, people see the cut. They know what the Cutty Sark is. It was the. It was in Greenwich and it caught fire. But before it was in Greenwich and it caught fire, it was it was one of the most famous ships in the world. And re and the the reason why it was famous and iconic was because for a time it was the fastest ship in the world. It was a tea clipper. And, and we like tea a lot. And so we needed to get tea from India and China back to London as quickly as possible because we wanted the best possible tea. And so and so they built these tea clippers, these super fast ships, and the Cuddy Sark was the fastest. And that's how it became famous. But it, the, it's a case study in, in, in sort of industrial evolution because the point is it was built some time after the first steamships came onto the scene. And, and in fact, economists call this the steamship effect. So the fact that steamships had arrived stimulated the old kind of ships, the sailing ships. It stimulated one last technological burst of innovation that got the last bits of productivity possible out of the old technology. Um, so without the pressure from the steamships, they might not have, have, have had these innovations. And But in the long run, the steamship still won and 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 the cutty sark saw out its days actually transporting wool from from australia to 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 the uk and probably wool thieves in the opposite direction at the same time um so so i, I think if if you want a way of thinking about what's going on i i think that's kind of a useful thing so is this the the last gasp the last technological squeeze out of the existent corresponding banking infrastructure and messaging systems and everything that goes with it? Or does it represent a step in the new direction? Now, I mean, I, I, I'm on record as, 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 I mean, I have called it the Cutty Sark once or twice. And I, and I did I did get thrown out of Cybos for saying that Swift was an affectionate homage to the 1970s. But, but that's the sort of store and forward messaging environment it comes from. So, I, you know, I'm not a gambling person, but if, but if 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 I was forced to go down to William Hills and put a fiver on it, I, I might be tempted to think this is, you know, this is this is the last uh, burst of innovation from the from the existing, and it's great, it's fantastic, it works really well, and for the next few years, it's going to do exactly what it says on the tin, and actually vastly improve most people's global international payment experiences but will it be there a generation from now 
or will you see the parallel infrastructure, the steamships of the of the of the blockchain, you know, cryptocurrency revolution? I, you know, I've got I've got a feeling if we're talking longer term, we might be glancing in that in that direction. So I, ho I hope I'm being fair there, Piers. I'm not. You know, I think GPI is fantastic, and actually, despite the time, I think Swift actually have done a pretty good job on it. So let, let's come back to that because I kind of want to end um, actually on on people's vision and where they're putting their five pounds. If if we were allowed out of the house to go down to the bookies <laughs> and, and put the money out, of course. Um, but so that's really interesting, and, and I think what what you've answered there, and it was like all good podcasts, we had a kind of pre-recording, and Dave started talking about ships, and Piers and I were kind of looking at each other and saying. Yeah, as lockdown finally got to him. Um, but I, th I think I think what you've answered there is kind of what, so why it's needed and maybe the response. And perhaps this is kind of Swiss response to, you know, the early steamships. Um, but here's back to you in terms of looking maybe in the near term. I think the longer term will come to in the near term. Obviously, it's been a, a relatively successful launch um, for, from Swift. But what is kind of 21 and, and, and 2022 hold? Um, what are the kind of gaps that there are in, in the product at the moment that they need to address and they're going to address, you see, um, yeah. in terms of that benefit to the, the customer? So I think I'm actually going to start with just coming back to the, the user problem. I'm a product manager and, and we, we try to position things as, as user problems rather than just starting with, with potential solutions. You're and, and product director, think, you need to elevate. With Dave on the call, obviously, it's all about elevating status because he's got this list thanks. of bio. But. <laughs> So Thank you, Rich. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> Did you need a product influencer? I stand ready to answer the call. Of course. Um, but I think for, for me, there's there were a couple of uh, a few different kind of reasons for this happening and, and, and user problems. And when I talk about I don't, I don't often like to, to use the word users, actually, because the only place that people are called users are, is in software or in drug drugs and the drugs industry um, but but we're talking about the the people who are sending these payments and it, it, I think there was this this frustration right and we talked about the four pillars but it was this frustration with the opaqueness the the, the, the lack of clarity about what was happening um, but I think in parallel to that as, as Dave mentioned it was perhaps this uh, emergence of the the steamships right there have been alternative uh, ways of sending money that have started to merge around the world. So whether that's from a perhaps the, 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 the fintech perspective of um, changing the perception of how a local ACH payment or instant payment works from a, from a cross-border perspective, right? So how do I send an instant um, payment in Singapore when I'm actually based in the UK? And there have been various fintechs, we've probably been, been a part of that as well, or helping to power other fintechs to do that, that have changed the end kind of person's perception of what a cross-border payment actually is. But I think the, the other emergence has, has, has been those types of blockchain-based um, uh, you know, solutions, potentially, that have, that have started to emerge, where this concept of sort of clearing settlement, of, of interbank messaging, really starts to, to, to fly out the window. Um, and there are, there are kind of these cases of technology being used to to do things in a very very different way. I think you know if we if we now talk about the near term future, I think the latest change from Swift side with the the, uh, the Swift standards in 20, November 2020, where um, they mean, mandated something called the confirmation of credit, where every um, institution who is receiving a Swift message now needs to start reporting back to the Swift tracker that. Kind of central data lake, regardless of whether they're a GPI member or not. Now, the SLAs, the time within which they have to report back to the tracker is, I think, two days at this point in time versus, I think, two to four hours for a GPI member. So there's definitely that allowance, that acceptance that, that um, perhaps some of the, the, the less technologically progressive, dare I say it, banks and institutions um, will need some more time to, to report back to the tracker. But that was the latest change, I think, started to close some of the holes that we were seeing perhaps in certain regions where uh, a correspondent, um, uh, a swift wire transfer was sent, and some of that information about exactly where it was in the chain or where it was at the beneficiary wasn't being reported back to the tracker. And we, we've, we've definitely seen improvements in um, the Asia Pacific region, um, also in the US, although in, in the US, just with the way that the, the, the payments land in the, um, the clearing system, there are still some holes to, to close. Um, so I think there's there's definitely that progression about closing those black holes. Um, but the 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 big thing I think for me that will we will start to now see from GPI is about inbound tracking. So 
imagine you've sent a, a payment um, from your, your, your bank or from your, um, your, your fintech, and that is GPI enabled. That payment lands within that data lake, the Swift tracker, uh, before it's necessary, you know, perhaps actually landed at any of the intermediaries or the beneficiary bank. So Swift in that position starts to have or starts to be able to, to, to distribute some of that information by technology with things like push notifications or, or um, uh, uh, software companies polling APIs. But you can now start to see information about a payment before it's even landed in your account or in your bank's account. And for me, that starts to become a really powerful sort of next step actually in this, in this cross-border payment space because we're saying that, especially for, for sort of safe senders, you know, people um, or companies who are sending repeat payments that don't get held up by compliance. They don't fail because they, they, you know, they're going to, to, the, to similar or the same beneficiaries time after time. Actually, if you know that that payment has been sent and it is en route to you, then it becomes purely an operational risk and not a credit risk to start enabling those funds to your, to your customer before the money is even landed in the account. And I think in terms of sort of getting the global digital economy moving, this starts to become really, really powerful that instead of money funds being literally held up in no man's land um, between correspondent banks over which the senders and receivers have got very little control, suddenly sender sends a payment, receiver gets a notification that that payment is en route. And the, the next step that, that needs to happen, so maybe the release of goods or services or, or maybe a salary payment, for example, actually can happen before the funds have even landed in that account. Um, uh, yeah, for, for me, that's kind of the most powerful next near-term step that, that we will probably start to see. It, it combines two, I mean, Piers is, is spot on. It, it, it combines two inexorable trends, I think. So one is, one is embedded finance in the sense that it's not really me. That, like, you know, I'm a small business too. And, and my interface to the world is QuickBooks. I have zero interest in, in logging into the bank and mucking about like I have to do now. I mean, I do everything in QuickBooks and then I have to come out and log into the bank. And, and you know, so embedding this stuff, you know, clearly that means that the end users will be removed from that. They don't want to take part in that banking experience right so so the idea is when when i see an invoice on quickbooks and i pay the supplier that's it i should never deal with it again so on the one hand you have this embedded finance and the apis and they need this kind of more modern version of the infrastructure but the other thing is what on the on the business side a, a lot of a lot of um organizations in their strategies now are shifting to what what it's lumped up as data driven liquidity so in other words if you if you've got the data you know, with the appropriate levels of trust. So, so to use to use Piers's point, um, if if I get the message in QuickBooks which says the money's on the way, actually, you know, for Barclays that's probably good enough. You know, they, I mean, they've known me for years. You know, I pay them God knows how much every month for all, whatever it is they do. Um, so it's good enough. So the message comes. So then I say, well, can you pay this other? You know, again, I'm I'm not dealing with the bank. I'm in QuickBooks doing this. But because data driven liquidity allows the institutions to deploy the kind of early artificial intelligence. I mean, it's better to call it machine learning rather than artificial intelligence at the moment. But actually, experience has shown to date that. And I, I don't know whether peers would agree with this or not, but from my point of view, experience has shown that you don't actually need that much of that data to make pretty good decisions. Like if, if you know, I'm an, I'm an SME, you know, if, if the bank can see three months of my of my accounts, it, that's good enough to let me you know whether they're going to let me have 50 quid that's coming in from a. So so actually, I think peers, the. The leverage that that applies, that it allows businesses to to put these new facilities on top, is is pretty important. Um, and those, I mean, whether we stay with shift, I mean, in 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 twenty years' time, maybe we'll be doing it using GPI, or maybe we'll be doing it using something else. But the stuff we have on top of it, you know, which is this much more data driven, much more intelligent infrastructure, this ecosystem for the payments to exist inside. I mean, I, I think that's probably, to businesses, that's probably more the revolutionary part mm -hmm. which GPI is enabling. So I, th I think, you know, Piers, you're spot on. But it, it's, it's because these kind of waves are all coming together now. 
you know. Yeah, I, th I think you both, it's a fascinating point, especially on the embedded finance side, because you have, you know, plenty of these businesses who aren't typically financial services businesses, um, who are looking to embed payments, for example, and th there's complexity around payments, but there's even more complexity around tracking payments and where payments go wrong. And, you know, there's fascinating stats around it, you know, take five, six times the amount of time to track a payment that's gone wrong than it does just to send the payment. And when you've got people who are not payments experts, these aren't banks and, and financial institutions. Um, that are, they're embedding this into their their ecosystems. So I think that's fascinating. Um, also, remember, remember, Richard, we, we, when we move into the the, I mean, I don't want to get sidetracked onto two hundred twenty two and all this sort of stuff. But but the truth is, we're moving into a much more data rich environment. So 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 with those messages, not it's not just the payment, it's it's you know invoice data and all the other stuff that we've. I could say we've dreamt about for years. I've dreamt about it. Normal people don't care about this one way or the other. But <laughs> but but um, but the fact is, it's a much more data rich environment that's being created here, and so the potential benefits. I mean, even we don't know what those are because we're you know there's. I mean, literally, I'm sure there are kids in basements right now. But actually, they're not. They're probably doing DeFi or something. But 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 there are R and D people in banks somewhere probably that are building stuff we don't even think about right now because that that additional data is the basis of value adding. And, and for me, I also come back to the fact that the payment is often the end result of something that has happened, some some exchange of goods or services or something else that's happened in the real world. And so the payment is, in effect, often the consequence of some other real world event. Um, and and you, you overlay that then with the additional data capabilities that can now start to flow with that payment. And you start to you, you, you really start to, to come into that world of fully automated um, uh, events that then drive uh, a payment in this case as, as the consequence of an event completing. Um, the invoice payment is, is, a, is a good example. You know, some some services are completed and, and um, on the back of pressing a few buttons in your, your QuickBooks application, for example, everything is done automatically for you. The, the act of making a payment really is totally forgotten about um, or should be forgotten about by, by the end user. Yes, exactly, because, because it, 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 it's part of the actual business process, not a separate thing. No, no, I, I, I agree with that, Piers. I mean, what I'm saying is I think the, the challenge for, for a lot of people right now is to sort of imagine what those value because because we don't know what those value adding services yeah. might be because we, we come from the old world, you know, um, whereas if you imagine the amount of data. So, 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 for example, suppose you can receive invoice data alongside an actual payment. And uh, you've got to send something back because something is incorrect or something like it. Those kind of things are awfully manual right now. And they, they, they just soak up cost where the, the more of that stuff that can go into the apis the more of that stuff that can go into the accounting package that I, I think it's very transformational and it sounds sort of it sounds sort of odd compared to talking about cryptocurrency and all this sort of thing but actually for the vast majority of businesses for the vast majority of trade and, and goods and services this stuff's far more important you know? so Listen, I, I do want to come on to the, I guess, some longer term potentially speculation or some bets and where you see. So I think we've talked about how you know, Swift GPI and whether or not it's it's future, you know, whether or not it's evolution or revolution, but it certainly kind of dug us and, and dragged us out of that kind of dark, opaque past uh, and brought us, you know, you brought and you know, appears you framed it from the customer problem, which I think is the right way to look at this in terms of increasing transparency, increasing speed data standards for the customers. I think you know the, the the API has made that possible in a number of different kind of distribution methods, and embedded finance being one of them. Um, and I think in, in the white paper we call this the, the first wave. It's the first wave of innovation in this um, sector. And Dave, I will I will come back to you, but Piers. So what's next? Into if we if we're looking forward five years, ten years, um, and we've talked a lot about kind of putting the the power into the hands of the the customers. Mm. Um, what would be your bets for the future? You know, is and you know, as I said, we'll, we may end on back onto the analogy of the Cutty Sark, but um, <laughs> where do you it's feel? A way of going? thinking about it. Oh, it is a great way of thinking. So, um, so I think we've actually touched on this at the moment. It's about embedding the financial transaction within something else. 
So again, Dave's, Dave's mentioned that as as the user within QuickBooks, but it's it's imagine yourself being any user in any application that is a non financial service application. That is where you are starting your your journey, whether it's from a from a business perspective or from from a from a retail perspective. You're you're not often or usually starting your your journey from within your banking application. And so I really think that it will be about this exposure of financial services via API, so via the piping. It effectively allows bits of data to get between two organizations um, that then fundamentally change some of the, the workflows, the experience from the non-financial service application that the end user um, happens to be sitting in. I think as a result of that, we will probably start to see quite a lot of consolidation within within the banking space. So some of those, you know, perhaps as I mentioned technologically progressive institutions um, who are really kind of transforming to, to the API way of thinking, you know, that that piping of data around the um, around the world, around the, the digital economy. I think there will start to be some consolidation where perhaps uh, some of the, the the institutions who aren't able to keep up um, really start to be marginalized and and the um the, the the majority of flows will start to be either deliberately chosen to go through the the progressive technologically enabled institutions by the end user or indeed by the software company that the end user chooses um that um are able to embed some kind of financial service within their application um so i think for for me over the next sort of 3 5 years it's it's really going to be about consolidation of, of some of the less technically enabled um, institutions but but perhaps an even greater market share for some of the the, the larger or, or technologically able um, institutions who let's, let's face it are not going to to disappear overnight they're not going to be disrupted they're not going to allow themselves to be disrupted um, by some of the big techs by some of the you know the alternative perhaps crypto based um, uh, solutions that are starting to appear um, at least in the short term. And then Dave, final word from you, and, and I'll put you on the spot. So 10, 15 years from now, so is Swift GPI the cutty sark um, of the... Well, look, I think, I think, I think, um, well, first of all, I'm not guessing about this stuff because remember, we, we have a little, I mean, you know, part of Consult Hyperion's thing is that clients tend to use us for, for new tech, like how can we exploit new technology? How can we do so? So one or two of these things are already being played around with. So I, 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 these aren't wild guesses. But if I if I wanted to pick one or two of the things that would push the thinking a little bit, you know, let let's imagine that GPI is the cutty sark, and so something else is going to to come along. I think if I were in the currency cloud skunk works right now, I'm sure they've got one somewhere. Um, I would definitely have central bank digital currency scribbled up on my whiteboard because in the three to five year horizon, uh, I think there's an inevitability about central bank digital currency, not particularly because of payments efficiency or domestic economies, but because of the international ramifications of it. Um, you know, a digital dollar, a digital euro, a digital something. These are really, really game changing, really important things. So, so first of all, I would, I would be thinking about central bank digital currency. Now, of course, that means that um, when I pay my supplier in Timbuktu, the money will just go from the wallet on my laptop, mobile phone, watch, hat, badge, PSP intermediary directly to them. There, there will be no correspondence and intermediaries and so on. So that has a huge impact. So that would be one thing. Um, if I was looking a bit further, I might be tempted to say, well, if we're going to send central bank digital currencies around like that, um, actually, they're a special case of a more generalized class of digital assets. So we might find ourselves shifting digital assets of a much broader spectrum across over those same new rails. So currency clouds business won't just be pounds and dollars and euros. It will expand greatly into some of the geographic some of them might be community based for all i know they'll be exchanging manchester city money for london pounds uh for for insert name of famous pop star dollars here you know so 
So I think there's a there's a broader range of digital assets that will be traded over those networks, which is very good news for, for Currency Cloud. If you want me to make a crazy prediction in the long run, the hard part of doing international payments is not payments. It's KYC, AML, CTF, PEP. You see the FATF travel rules. You see 6AML. I wonder if the long-term future of SWIFT isn't switching money at all, but switching identity. Because if I'm sending the central bank digital currency and the Manchester City money and the Ariana Grande dollars over instantaneous wallet-to-wallet -wallet rails, I've still got to do the KYC. And that's a cost right now, which is spiraling out of control. And there doesn't seem to be any obvious way why I shouldn't be able to send identity, reputation, relationship information, credentials and attributes over a global coordinated network. So if you want a crazy Cutty Sark style prediction, in the long run, SWIFT will be switching identity, not money. Fascinating. Well, listen, thank you uh, to both of you. Um, if they do want to find out more of your kind of crazy predictions, Dave, where, where can people find you? www.chip.com, uh, chyp.com. And Piers, how about Currency Cloud? It's www.currencycloud.com. I could have answered that myself, but I thought we could <laughs> on the spot. Listen, thanks, guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, I think fascinating. And I think so many good things are coming out at the moment it's going to be really interesting to see what you know the really smart brains and smart minds of people behind some of these uh, initiatives and, and products and businesses uh, deliver over the next kind of two three years um and and longer but thank you for your time oh thanks guys it was fun currency cloud is an online payments company that makes international money transfers fast and simple for businesses we're building a borderless future where international transactions are seamless for a better user experience. Discover the world's most trusted payment platform and our toolkit of developer-friendly APIs at currencycloud.com. You've been listening to the Payments Innovation Podcast. To ensure that you never miss an episode, subscribe now in iTunes or your favorite podcast player. Thanks for listening. Until next time.